Okay, so welcome, Jane Tesner Klein again, uh, Lower Columbia Nature Network, and we're excited to have you join us for our March meeting. Um, we are a project of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, the Ridgefield Complex, and I see Juliet Fernandez is with us today. She is the refuge manager for the complex, so we're grateful for their sponsorship for the Lower Columbia Nature Network and hosting uh, this session today with uh, John Muir Laws. If you're new to the Nature Network, well, thank you and welcome. Um, we are a coalition, a regional coalition of Southwest Washington agency stakeholders and partners who are committed to connecting our community to nature. And we have a, a website that is we're trying to build as we speak, um, but feel free to check us out at lowercolumbianaturenetwork.org. And our mission is to make nature welcoming to everyone. We want everybody to have the opportunity to feel safe and welcome to go outside uh, we work to elevate our partners in the network to make sure everybody has the resources they need to successfully run their programs. And our overall goal is to reduce barriers of access so that everybody feels safe and welcome and excited to go outside and learn. Uh, today's agenda, I'm going to uh, run a quick poll here um, to see who's in the room with us so far. I know there's many other folks who are going to join us once they um, they get in the room. So. If you wouldn't mind taking a second to uh, answer this poll really quick, we just want to make sure we know who's in the room today. And if we need to tailor our content at all, this would just help us understand who's here today. So just let us know um, what your role is in the community um, and a little bit about uh, if you've done nature journaling before. So we'll go ahead and we have a few more folks joining us. So we'll just give this a uh, minute to see who's in the room today. So far, it looks like we have several high school teachers, some nonprofit ed environmental educators, some local government uh, government staff environmental educators. Ah, we have somebody who has done nature journaling, some folks who know a little bit about it. And several folks, this is new. Awesome. Okay. Great. Uh, I'm going to just share this with you all for a second. There you go. to do okay so there you go jack you can see who's who's with us today and um that's a really great uh great response thank you for that we really appreciate your time with that okay let me close that down um so today uh we're gonna get to jack here in just a minute uh please do feel free to use the chat if you have questions if you'd like to introduce yourself uh, your name, your role in the program that you're with. I'll feel free to use the chat for that. I'll try to monitor for questions, um, but I think we're okay to take questions throughout as well. So feel free to unmute yourself if you have a, a pressing question. We do plan to leave a little bit of time at the end for folks to have a discussion as well. And then I have a little bit of housekeeping at the very end um, to just go over some upcoming uh, events and activities with the Nature Network. Um, so with that, I would love to introduce our um, guest speaker for today, uh, John Mears Laws. If you're not familiar, um, I will also spotlight you here, Jack, doo -doo -doo -doo, so that everybody can see you. There you are. <laughs> um, he is an amazing uh, artist, naturalist, uh, educator, and um, has led the movement for nature journaling around the world. And we're excited to have him here joining us in Southwest Washington virtually. Um, it sounds like he's got a storm there. So if we lose you, we'll stay on the line and wait for you to, to blow back in. Yeah, yeah. Um, if That's, you're not familiar. How just blew by, actually. <laughs> if you are Surprising. not, <laughs> I hope he lands safely. Um, if you're not familiar with his website, please feel free to check it out, johnmuirlaws.com. Um, there are lots of great online lessons and a calendar of events, lots of videos um, that you can watch to learn more. Um, he is the founder of the Wild Wonder Foundation and also the most amazing conference you will ever experience. Um, it's September 13th through 17th. Um, I have to tell you, when I watched last year with my 10 year old, the Boxy Critters was one of our favorites. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Love the Boxy Critters. So, you know, save your time in September to join a really amazing conference. Even if you can't watch the whole thing all the way through, go back and watch it. it your time allows, but it's really super amazing to connect with other nature journalists uh, around the world. And I myself am not an artist. I'm a naturalist trying to do art, but you do not have to be an artist to do this work. And I'm sure Jack will lead us into that. But 
with that, I'm going to stop sharing. And Jack, please welcome to Southwest Washington. Hey, thank you, folks. I'm really delighted to be here with all of you. Um, and uh, we're hoping that the storms don't blow out our power here. And if that's the case, I'm really happy to be here for the next hour and a half with you. And in this time, what I want to do is um, I'm going to try to get you hooked on this whole nature journaling thing. I have been, my, most of my life and my career, I've been in one form of environmental education or another. And in this time, um, I have not found any tool more powerful than a journal to connect people in an authentic way with the natural world around them. And to, to do programming with this, you don't need to, um, you don't need to be an artist. You don't need to be a journaler. You don't need to have a deep level of naturalist expertise because the process um, focuses on getting participants to make their own authentic observations and to record those themselves, to make their own questions and their own connections, and to, um, to, to, to put those down in a, in, in a way that makes their experience of being in nature with you much more engaging. And I'm going to, I'm going to sort of show you the, the basic process. I'm going to sort of start like open up a nature journal and sort of show you like, this is what my nature journal or journal looks like. Um, and then we'll kind of unpack how we kind of go about doing that and some of the philosophy that is behind it. Um, but again, you don't need to be an artist. You don't need to be um, somebody who has been journaling for a long time to do this. And the ease of, developing these programs for participants, it's really surprising for the, 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 in, the, the participants come away with an uh, immersive personalized um, experience that really helped them drop into a place. And the people who facilitated it, um, we just kind of had to point them in the right direction. And it's cool because the process really starts taking care of itself. Um, because it's, I, th I think the reason is because it's, it's, it's authentic. Um, this is something that, this is not something that I invented. It's not something that is new. It is something that um, naturalists and anybody who's been trying to pay attention to the world for a long time, um, uh, that pe people have used and it works. Um, I'll kind of give my, my, my background a little bit with this. I started natural history uh, interpretation um, by filling my own head with as many nature facts as I could. And then I would go uh, out in the field with people and I tried to download as many of those as I could. And um, I then tried to do that in a dynamic way, in an entertaining way, in a way that was funny. And if I could keep people entertained while I'm kind of giving my, my spiels, um, I, I felt that I was doing, I was a good naturalist um, because um, I was getting positive feedback. Um, and the more I've looked at educational research, um, it, it, and also from my own personal experience, um, a lot of that was an illusion. I really did a great job. I kept people entertained. People would give good reviews for the nature walks that I did. But I don't think they were learning that much. Um, I don't think that they came away transformed. And they definitely didn't come away with a set of skills that they could use themselves at any time that they wanted, the next time that they went out into, out into the forest. And um, I, when we're doing the introductions, um, one of the things uh, that this net, <clears throat> one of the things that this network, um, one of the goals you said that one of your goals is making nature welcoming to everyone. I think a big problem is that for a lot of us, we when we kind of run out into the woods, we don't know what we're supposed to do. And how am I supposed to interact with this place? Um, and um, if you kind of grew up in a culture of going to parks and places like that, you've had from the example of your elders, um, you've seen ways of doing that. 
but for people who families that don't have um, a, a, a long tradition of 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 being out in nature, you get out there and like, what are you supposed to do? I guess we should have a picnic. Um, that's what we do in parks. I guess we're going to have a picnic. Um, and like, oh, there's a ranger walk, and you go on the ranger walk, and you, and my experience from some of those experiences is is that you come away just kind of like, wow, she sure knew a lot about shorebirds. But the individual isn't transformed. And I haven't given them a tool that the next time that they can go out, that they can use themselves. The next time they go out, they might say like, yeah, let's go on another nature walk with a ranger. But it's, that's different than, than, you know, the idea of teaching them to fish. And that's, I think, where nature journaling comes in. Um, what it is, it's a, it's a simple system. You have some sort of a notebook and a, and a tool to, to document what you're experiencing. And we've got a number of um, protocols and activities to kind of help make it easier for people to observe something and document what they observed. Observe and document, observe and document. You start doing that. And then we have ways of adding in curiosity and questionings and making connections between things. And um, the purpose of this is to expand the capacity of your brain. So the, the, the human brain, this wad of electric meat that's, that's between your ears, um, as wonderful as it is, this is pretty maxed out. This wad of electric meat um, is fatigued by the effort of observation. This wad of electric meat has a hard time holding multiple pieces of information. And if you like, you go on a hike and you learn something and you learn something and you learn something, once you get more than seven or so little nuggets, your brain starts kicking out others to make room for the new ones. So um, we can only really kind of juggle what they, they figure seven ideas plus or minus two. And we want people to observe really deeply um, and be transformed by the experience. But the nature of our human brain is resistant to that sort of change. And it's resistant to the work of even paying attention in a place. So I like to use a crutch and the crutch is the journal. Um, Let's take, let me open up one of my nature journals and I'm going to show you kind of the stuff that I do in mine. And the problem with me showing you this is that um, because I am dyslexic, in my journals, I have started from an early day, age, I made a lot of pictures in my journals. And anything that you do a lot of, you get better at. And so now down the line, this closet over there is jammed with journals. I've made a lot of pictures, so I've gotten better at drawing. And so now the problem is when people look at this, they see like, oh, wow, that's a really pretty picture. And then you go like, oh, the purpose of this is to make pretty pictures, right? Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. So you're out in the woods and you're making pretty pictures of nature things. I think I understand what's going on. But that's actually not it at all. The, if you want to make pretty pictures, that's, that's fine. And it will come if you just start making lots of pictures. But for nature journaling, we're not wrapped around the axle about making pretty pictures. Um, we use pictures as a way of recording information. Similarly, we're going to use words and we're going to use numbers. So we've got words, pictures, and numbers as three different languages to take the world around us and put it down in our journals. And the, um, but if you get wrapped around like I have to make a pretty picture, then it makes it really hard to make any pictures. So um, I'm gonna show you this, um, but my challenge is to say, is, is not to kind of go, the oh, this must be for pretty pictures, All right? Let me, let me see if we can successfully change cameras, there we are. All right, here is um, a nature journal of mine. Um, 
And what I've got is that's, that's a, actually a real leaf that I've taped in there. Um, this is a drawing of that same leaf. This is some notes about other leaf. This is some um, thoughts and observations about what I'm seeing. Um, this is uh, going out on another day and looking at on an ornamental shrub, the different kinds of buds and flowers and fruit that were growing on it. Um, this is um, a little map of where the trillium was blooming um, on a little walk I took with my, my daughter. Here's a picture of the trillium. Here's an enlargement of the stamen. And here is counting the number of plants that were dark purple, medium purple, or white. Most of them were were white. So I'm recording what I'm seeing. Um, here's a little diagram showing that the white flowers were in a cluster here, and the purple flowers were in a cluster over here. Interesting. Um, so what um, what I'm doing when I'm when I'm doing this is. Um, I'm intentionally using these three languages, words, pictures, and numbers. So the part of your brain that is, does a lot of visual stuff is, is uh, actually in the back of your brain here. You've got your visual cortex back here. Your prefrontal cortex up here handles lots of, of stuff with words. And it's neat, when we get people um, under an fMRI machine and we give them math problems, an area in the, along the side of, above your ear lights up. So when I'm actually using words and pictures and numbers, I'm using different parts of this brain. Um, and so when I, when I do this, I'm giving myself essentially more of a trampoline for my my for to for this experience that I'm having to kind of bounce around on in and around my electric meat I'm intentionally grinding it into different parts of my brain and that changes the way that I experience it of these three systems words pictures and numbers you notice there's some measurements in here um, it's not that one is better than the other they are each different but the um, by using them together, I am going to have a richer experience in investigating whatever phenomenon that I'm, 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 I'm looking at. If I were just to draw a picture, that would really constrain the way that I think. Similarly, just using words. Um, so this is, is one of my, uh, my notebooks. This is, was during the, uh, the COVID epidemic. This is my notes on catching COVID. Uh, this is before we had those vaccinations. Thank you, science. I appreciate not having this experience anymore. It wasn't fun, but I got through it. Um, and then here's a little bit of um, thinking, because uh, I, I, uh, I did not have, we didn't have the tests then, so we didn't know for sure if it was. Um, and so thinking about, was this COVID or, or, or wasn't it? Um, and then some, some more thinking about that. Um, any, anything that happens to me, anything that I experience, like if I find caterpillars eating poppies, that's a phenomenon that I can explore in my journal. Um, so if I find, uh, I found a little caterpillar, I tried to rear it, it pupated, and the stachinid fly came out. So here's a drawing of this parasite of a sphinx moth. Um, that's a phenomenon, and... I can record that in my journal. Anything that I notice from the weather to, this is the, the, the irises that were growing outside my neighbor's house. Um, I can, by keeping a journal, I can notice much more about that experience than I could if I just walk up to it and stare at it. If you go up and you stare at nature, nature just stares back. Um, but if you're documenting what you're seeing, you will notice more and more and more and more and levels of detail. These are notes more about, so you notice I'm following this, this iris through time. 
Um, and then this, uh, here I'm following the, uh, an orange that went moldy in my kitchen, and I'm following that through time. Um, so the phenomenon that you're looking at doesn't have to be anything that is rare and unusual. Uh, here I am recording the height of the sun at the solstices and the equinox from the school playground behind my house. So it goes higher in the sky in summer, lower in winter, wider across the horizon in summertime, and a narrower arc in the wintertime. Um, by taking these observations and putting them in this book, I am able to both in the moment observe much more and then also be able to remember that and carry that on. So some people think that you need to go to some exotic place, um, and you can do this if you go to an exotic place. Um, so here are, uh, here are notes on the Galapagos Islands and observations of tortoises and, 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 and other cool things that were, were happening in the Galapagos Islands. Um, we human beings are attracted to novel things, new things. And so something like this really kind of gets us to lean in. But what I find is that I can get the same level of fascination looking at the orange that is turning moldy in my cupboard if I get myself to look at it more deeply and to record information about it in as, with as many tools as I have. So let's take a look at what those tools are and, and how this looks. Um, actually, first, what I'd like to do is I'm going to turn back for a second to this cam, and I'm going to bounce over to my gallery view so I can now see all your faces. Hi. Um, so what I'd like to do is just to, we've had a, a brief um, introduction um, to this. Um, are there any initial questions that um, have uh, come to you about what we are, um, what we're talking about here and what is um, about nature journaling? And you can either use the raise hand button um, or what you can do is just turn on your screen and wave at me and I'll see that you've got a question and and not seeing any questions from you folks you're either don't have questions or you're really shy it's okay as as we're going along I want yeah, this is not a shy group <laughs> okay good so um, so as we're going along, uh, I encourage you to uh, just get a, a, a notepad and as, as questions come up to you, uh, quickly write those down um, um, and, uh, and feel free to ask me as we're moving along here. Um, another thing that you can do is to drop them into the chat. I won't be monitoring the chat, but, um, uh, but Jane will be watching the chat and she'll say like, oh, I just saw that. Oh, hey, Valerie, good to see you again. I'm seeing friends in the audience. Um, and we do have a question. Look at that. Oh, bam. Just like that. Just like that. Do, see, all you had to do was ask. Take, uh, do you take all your paints and colors with you in your nature journeys? Um, yes, I do. Um, I, I, and the, what I recommend here, I'm using the stuff that you're seeing in the journal that I opened up um, was uh, I'm using paints to do that. So I have a portable watercolor set and a small set of portable gouache paints. Um, and but what I recommend people do when they are starting is to take a small set of colored pencils. And the learning curve on colored pencils is they're much more forgiving. Watercolor will mess with you when you are starting to try to play with it. And it will kind of give you a lot of grief. Um, so if you start trying to, um, trying to keep a nature journal and learn watercolor at the same time, um, when watercolor gives you a hard time, you will blame the challenging experience on nature journaling and perhaps do it less. 
Um, so I recommend people start with uh, some colored pencils. Just a, you don't need one of those giant boxes, just a small set kind of tied together with a rubber band and you are, um, you're, you're good to go. So the tools you need for this are really simple. Essentially, if you can get yourself a notebook and a pencil, how big a notebook I think does matter. Um, I used to really think it was cool to have a little notebook that would just slip into my pocket. And I find that those kind of notebooks are good for grocery lists. But the minute you want to do kind of deeper observation about something, it's so small that you can't get um, a lot of ideas adjacent to each other on the same page. And that's one of the things that's an advantage of journaling. You make an observation, you put it on the page. You make another observation, you put it on the page. Observation, put it on the page. So you see something, say something. You stick it on the page. Um, the same with your questions and the connections that you're making. And then what happens is you, um, when you're seeing these ideas and these observations adjacent to each other in your notes, it will change the way that you think about them because you're now seeing all these ideas together and seeing them together on the page helps you be able to start to make connections between those. So bring a journal that is, is as large as you will realistically, regularly bring with you into the field. Um, and no larger. Um, if it's too big, you're just gonna leave it at home because it's gonna be a hassle. All right. Um, do you think in advance about the structure on the page or create it on the fly? Um, uh, also, do you tend to, um, to start with words, numbers, or pictures, or does it depend on the subject, um, and the entry? Well, let's actually kind of, let's, let's take a look at that. Um, what I do, I'm going to just sort of reach out onto my table here, and I'm going to sort of show that we can kind of do this with um, uh, just about any phenomenon. And I reach out onto my table here and I found a stuffed hedgehog, All right? So I've got my daughter's stuffy. She loves this hedgehog and it keeps appearing everywhere. Um, you can't kind of sit down in a chair without kind of bumping into this hedgehog. So what I'm gonna do is just kind of a quick demo using this hedgehog. Why this hedgehog? Because it's here, All right? And what I'm going to do is just a little demo of how this might go, right? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to first demonstrate the process. And then what I'm going to do is I am going to, you got to admit, that is cute, right? Yeah, uh-huh. Um, so what, what you want to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first demonstrate how I would work with this hedgehog. And then we will kind of metacognitively um, explore what happened with that. All right? You ready? So um, I suggest that at home, you grab your own paper so you can take your own hedgehog notes. All right? Let's go. I'm going to go to... The thrill cam again, there it is. And I have a blank piece of paper in front of me. And I'm gonna see which speaker, I'm gonna change speakers. Um, I just switched speakers, can I still be heard clearly? Can you hear me? Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Yes, you're good. All right, um, I am, so, Here's my hedgehog. And what, what I usually do is you're wondering, like, how do you start? Start with your comfort zone. Start with whatever is easy for you. Wait, hold on a second. I don't see. Um, my screen is frozen. You're just seeing a white piece of paper, right? That's correct. No, that's just so long, wrong. We're going to remove that spotlight. I'm going to put that spotlight, uh, spotlight for everyone. And I am going to stop my video. I'm going to restart my video. Um, now you see me. Yes, we do. And now let's go to a frozen Jack. Um, uh, we're going to try this again. I'm going to disconnect. 
working splendidly a moment ago. Plug it back in. Aha, there we have a pad of paper and a hedgehog. All right, so how do I start? Um, here's a very, very um, successful trick. Start with talking to whatever phenomenon you're looking at, all right? Um, so um, if you stare at something, it's just going to stare back at you. You stare at nature, nature just stares back. Um, and what we want to do is to try to get our brain to collect a little bit more information intentionally about this phenomenon. So um, if I say out loud whatever it is that I'm seeing, I'm going to notice a lot more. If I just look at the hedgehog and think to myself, I'm looking hard at this, what I'll tend to do is notice a few features and then re-notice those. But so here's what I do. This is called what uh, psychologists call the production effect. I'm going to be just be saying out loud whatever it is that I, I, I notice about it. All right, so um, smooth gray back with a little seam down the middle going all the way down. Um, kind of cute head, very pointy nose, black at the tip and very beady black eyes. Um, out, made out of a different kind of material, two little ears of folded felt and then four little limbs. The top ones being bigger, these ones, um, the bottom ones being smaller. Um, so small limbs, very round body, very, very compact, no real kind of head to body contour change. Um, so you see what I'm doing? I am saying out loud whatever it is that I see. Oh, and there's a little mouth. Look at that. You got a little mouth kind of going down, kind of hard to see that, but there's a little line coming down to a little, little hedgehog mouth. Very, very cute. Uh, adorable. Now there's a there's a tab going about. This is made by Aurora. Hello, Aurora. And um, product of the United States. Hmm, look at that. So there is, so what I've been doing is I have been talking to this stuffed hedgehog. Um, and the now if I were to, to, to kind of take this away, all the observations that I had made about this hedgehog would still be in my brain because I took the time to say those out loud. But if I just been staring at it, I would move this away and then my brain would really not hold as much information as I can, right? So um, I start by talking to it. And then, then I suggest that people kind of go to whatever your comfort zone is. So if you're more comfortable writing, just start with a bullet point list of, of kind of, of, of salient features, um, gray back. And it has um, tan face, tummy, hands, All right? Um, it has a uh, black nose, All right? So you could start by, um, by just taking your observations and listing them. Um, because I am dyslexic, I tend not to write as much as, as other people. And so um, I will often start with a little sketch. Sketch. Um, oops, I meant to go to speaker. Now let's see if we can get back to that throw cam. Yes, it is still working. Hooray. So what I will often do is I will often make a little sketch of whatever it is that I am looking at. Um, and the, the more you, if you haven't sketched since elementary school, then the first time you try that, it's going to be challenging. Um, and there's also, it's easy for us to kind of really judge ourselves about art. Um, and because we're used to people drawing pictures when they want to make a pretty picture, not drawing pictures like a naturalist, where they, um, where where they're they're just trying to notice something about something. You notice what I've I've done here is I've got a little blue pencil and I'm lightly just blocking in the shape of this hedgehog and. 
it's kind of a loose sort of sketchy drawing. Um, but still, because I've had more experience making lots of drawings, I'm, I'm getting something that is kind of fairly representational of my little, my little hedgehog friend. Um, I like to first block in the general shape that I get. And then what I do is I will then start to go over that with a pen or another pencil. And once I've got my basic shape blocked in, I can then, there we go. There's my kind of shaggy. Once I've got this, this, this basic shape in, um, I can draw details on top of that a lot more easily. So for instance, when I'm drawing this ear, I can look at the ear and go, it's got a straight top, and then it kind of curves down, and it has an edge that comes down like this, this top edge here. And um, I can do that with a little bit more kind of care because I already know where that eye goes, where that ear is, is going to be. I can then focus on what is the shape of that. or putting a little highlight in my eye. This is the first time in one of my workshops I've drawn a stuffy. I think. Yeah, I think it is. We're, we're excited to be the first for the hedgehog stuffy. First, I mean, it is a really solid stuffy. All right, and there's a little mouth that is coming down in here. And so, so what I'm doing is I am, I'm making a visual representation of what I'm seeing. And invariably, there are going to be parts of this drawing that are going to be useful for conveying information about this little stuffy. And there are other parts that are not going to kind of go the way that you want it. And when that happens, rather than being really frustrated, what I want to do is to pull in another tool. Because if, let's say I, there's something I don't like about this drawing, um, or, or, or just like when it's like this, we tend to look at it and we start thinking of it as an art piece. Right? But I don't want this to be thought of as an art piece. I want this to be a scientific investigation of a phenomena. Um, so I noticed that it is cute. Um, so what I recommend people often do is to not think of these things as a drawing. Instead, think of them as, as a little diagram. So let me show you, like, uh, let's say you, you've got this here. Notice how much information is conveyed. And, but what if I, if I say, pointy nose. So I noticed something, I could put that in this list, but I'm, I'm putting it in as a little, as a label. Um, uh, this fur is, is lighter on the outside and darker under fur. Um, so I'm going to say fur, um, darker when um, pressed backwards. Um, and it is sort of a purple gray. Um, the ears are felt.
So do you see how once this becomes a labeled drawing, it becomes even more interesting, right? Um, and you see the, the same thing with, about, you know, with, with lots of phenomena that we, we see out there. So if I have a, um, uh, something that I'm, I'm a plant that I'm looking at, um, I will often add in little labels. You know, these are leathery leaves. And once these labels start going in there with those pictures, this meat is firm here. Um, some streaks are turning purple on the northeast side. Hmm. Um, so that makes this constellation of information much richer. And um, so I'm going to put a little bit of orange in here in the face. And on these. Now, that's why am I using orange? Because I have an orange pencil with me. But this guy isn't really orange. It's more of a tan, but I don't have a tan pencil. And so I'm going to then draw a little line and I'm going to say uh, that this part is uh, warm tan. Right? So this labeled drawing, much more information. And now, um, let's see here. I am going to, let's see here. How might I, oh, I know what I can do. Hold on just a second. I'm going to figure out how big my friend is. And from bottom to the top of the head, we are 19, uh, nine and a half centimeters. So look at this. I'm going to draw a line coming in this way, another line coming in this way. And I am going to. right in here that this is 9.5. So this is roughly life size. But um, so what I've done is I've used words. I have used pictures. I have used numbers. Let's find out what part is the softest. The tummy. Tummy is warm tan, very soft. So soft is not something I can easily show in um, uh, in my drawing, but I can add that with words. So uh, notice I'm intentionally using words, pictures, and numbers. Now, most of what I've got here is observation. Well, observation and a little bit of opinion that it is cute. And But what I also want to do is I am going to deliberately start asking questions about this. So I'm going to say to myself, all right, um, what, uh, oh, this is, this is a towel-like texture, towel-like texture. Hmm. Um, so I am going to start to ask questions. So one thing I'm wondering about is, as, as you're looking at this, if there's any questions that occur to you, um, uh, please add those into the chat. But something that I'm wondering about, what is it about the proportions, about the shape of something that makes for a successful, cute, stuffy? Like, what is it that really kind of like, I, I think that this is a really a, a winning stuffy. I think this is really great. What, what is it that is about, so I'm going to ask, you know, what makes a stuffy 
really good. So sometimes that it's cute, although I know sometimes some of the, the, our favorite stuffies in our house, they're not particularly cute. Um, I'm thinking uh, they, this one sort of, it's got, it sort of has a personality. Personality. And then that makes me think like, what is it when I say that it has a personality? What do I mean by that? And once I, real, I, I, once I write personality on here, I realize that I don't know what I'm really talking about. So like, I'm gonna draw a little question to that. Like, what is personality in a, in, in a, in a stuffy, right? So you see what I'm doing here is I am asking a question of the phenomenon. I'm asking a question of the phenomenon. And I write that down. And if I really like that question, then I will often put a big question mark next to it. I'm even going to paint that orange. Like I said, colored pencils, they're your friends. Watercolors, learning curve. Colored pencils, mm hmm, that's what I'm talking about. All right, so look at that. So I've got this. This kind of that's a rich question that is that has come from this. What is it that makes something a good stuff? What is it that when we sort of see cute, what do we mean? And um, when, and, and with this sort of personality idea, like what's, what's going on with that? I've intentionally made myself curious about the phenomenon that I'm looking at. And that's a really, really big part of this process. I need to make myself get curious about the world around me. Once I do that, the world really starts to open up. The final piece is I want to try to make any connections between this and other things that I've seen. So I do this process that I call it reminds me of. It reminds me of. So sometimes I'll do I-R-M-O. And I can just make a little list like this reminds me of Carolyn. One reason I think I feel so affectionate about this stuffy is because I've seen my daughter hold it, right? So I associate it with her, and that makes this a better stuffy for me. Um, what else do I associate it with? Um, I associate it with Beatrix Potter. Right? Um, I associate it with movie night. Right? So anything that that and these it reminds me of is they can be scientific or personal, but whatever it is in my brain that is associated with this, that in one way or another kind of I connect with, I want to say those things out loud. Um, here's an it reminds me of this fur that different colors, different directions. I've seen in some wild animals, um, there's this light colored under fur. Um, and that makes me wonder, I'm gonna draw a line from this. I'm gonna say, why do some animals have lighter, Uh, under fur. Huh. Um, and it's same, same, same with birds. So birds too. Exclamation point. Um, so sometimes like birds, they've got the, the darker feathers have melanin in them. Is, is it melanin that is making fur of mammals dark? So hold on, melanin, uh, does it make fur dark too? So in bird feathers, the melanin is a strengthening thing and it's in those wingtips and makes them dark and parts that are not we don't have the melanin, they, they fall apart more easily. But I'm wondering if things that don't have melanin, um, does that, are they better insulators? Like the under feathers of birds, often they're really pale, right? So if I think of a bird feather, right? 
and it will have out at the tip, it'll be darker. And then towards the base of it, you'll get these, these white parts, right? So is white a better insulator? Whoa. All right, so this is kind of interesting. So let's let's check this out. So this is this was not intentional. This was not my intention when I pulled out this stuffy. But this is the train of thought that this stuffy has um, taken me on. So I started off just with general appearance, and then I got into this idea of the fur here being um having having a different color underneath and then that took me over to thinking about why some real animals have that and that then brought me over to thinking about the melanin and that brought me over to bird feathers so you see this little kind of chain of thinking now i'm wondering is 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 the white a better insulator now i'm going to put a little flash around that because that's an interesting thought that i want to follow up on and because i want to follow up on that i'm now going to write draw a little square here with a little shadow box around it and i'll check that box off once i have followed up on that question whoa And this guy's name is Hedge. So I have by looking at a stuffed animal ended up with an interesting observation and i had fun doing it so that is some notes about hedge here right and what it started with is i have a phenomenon and I described this phenomenon using pictures and words and numbers. I have my observations. I have questions. And here's another question. So this ended up with another question. These it reminds me of. This is this is this is another big question down here. Uh, this it reminds me of ended me with a really, really rich, strange, fun question. That would not have happened if I pulled this out and said, everybody look at my stuffed hedgehog. This happened because I was downloading it to paper. The fact that I got here is a direct result of putting this on paper. And if you just look at something, if you just look at something, what's going to happen is you are going to, your brain looks at it until you, you, you feel that you have... Um, so you're going to look at something until um audio check i just changed microphones can you still hear me you did Good. all right 
So you're going to look at something until you, 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 the, your, your brain goes like, okay, for my survival, basically I've got this, I can bounce to the next thing. But even with a stuffed hedgehog, you can get yourself to notice things that you've never noticed before, ask questions that you've never asked before, and make connections that you have never uh, made before. But what you have to do is to get it out of this space and into this space. The way you will think is totally different. People think it's like really cool that Leonardo da Vinci was this smart person who happened to also have made some notebooks and left behind documents of his thinking. But that is actually backwards thinking. Leonardo da Vinci was who Leonardo da Vinci was because Leonardo da Vinci was keeping those notebooks. So the Leonardo that we know is a direct result of the notebooks. So what we can do is we can go out and we can teach participants in our programs how to do this. And I, I, I had fun with my hedgehog. Um, did, I hope you enjoyed kind of going on the hedgehog journey with me, right? This actually was fascinating for me to see kind of where things went with the stuffed hedgehog. And, um, but that would not have happened without the notebook. That is a, that's a direct outcome of the notebook. So what I want to do now is to, <clears throat> um, oh, so I'm, I'm noticing I've just bounced over to the chat. I've, I've been taking notes on everything you're talking about because it's amazing. This, this, I hope this, this is, this, are you having fun with this? Yeah, it's great. I, so, let, can I ask you a question? Because you've yeah. done this so much and I can see it with my own kids if I even just take my two or three kids out, um, but taking a classroom out outside into the natural world, it's all of a sudden a lot. Yeah. What's, your, what's your technique with getting to come down to one thing or one observation or one phenomenon because so you could all go everywhere with it. Learning how to pay attention is hard. So um, paying attention is work. Um, and we cannot really maintain that in an effortful way for very long. Um, that's why it's actually, it's interesting that it's called to pay attention because you actually have an energy budget. Um, I'm reading this book called Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman right now. And one of the points that he's making is that paying attention burns glucose really fast. And that um, you can, you, you have people trying to pay attention to something and their ability to do that just goes, starts high and just goes, mm, and they're measuring glucose levels in people who are paying attention to things and watching that crash. Um, and so when you get, sort of get your kids to do this, you know, you're gonna have a limited time before we need the snack. And how do you do that in an environment that is, it's sensory overload. So if this, by the way, if this is the first time that these students have come out of the classroom, and they're now outside on the field trip. They're so jacked and wired from that that they're totally distracted. If you say, look, I've got these journals for you. I've got a new tool for you. And we're gonna be doing stuff in our journals and you give them the journal. This is a distraction. If you give them a magnifying glass, the first time you give out magnifying glasses, it's a distraction. And they're like, oh, they're burning things. And they're like, you're losing them, right? Um, and first time they get a set of colored pencils, it's a distraction. They're organizing them all and like resharpening them. And um, so there are all these distractions. And then you go out into this environment with everything. And they don't know where to focus. So what I do when I'm teaching this with kids is at the start, 
we, um, what I just dem demonstrated here um, kind of comes after a long time of practicing. I was using words, pictures, and numbers, and I also was making observations, I was asking questions, and I was doing this, it reminds me of. So by the way, that's, that's my framework. Nature journaling, here's your short definition. It is, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. That's a triad. Mixed with words, pictures, and numbers. You take those two triads, you stick them together, and then you push that down onto a page, and that's what the process is. But um, at the start, I, the kids aren't going to have that skill set. So what you do is you pick a little activity and a very discrete phenomenon. And we're going to use these techniques on that phenomenon. And so later on, when they've had lots of experience with this, then um, you, what you can do is you can just kind of go, say, like, go out into the forest, find something amazing, and nature journal about it. But if you try to do that at the start, people will just, they're totally overwhelmed. So what, what we'll do is we'll say, I need you. I, was, I, I just was doing a nature journaling um, uh, study with a group of students over the weekend. And we're by a stream. And there are all these, these incredible skipping stones and things. So what we did is <laughs> there was a big distraction there. And I said, I want everybody to find the coolest rock you can and also find some really good skipping stones. And so we looked around and we were finding cool rocks and everybody was getting, I want this rock, I want this rock, I want this rock. And then we skipped some rocks because skipping rocks is fun. And then we walked away from the gravel bar where all the rocks were because that's where the distraction is. And everybody brought their other favorite rock with them. And then we sat in a little circle and we did this nature journaling activity with your rock. So out of all the rocks on that beach, you picked yours. And um, the, and that was the phenomenon that you were going to, 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 to focus in on. And um, so at the start, I give them the phenomenon. And I give them a prompt of here's what we're going to do with it. So for instance, with these rocks, what we did is we, we said, I want, we, we first they put their rock on their paper and they traced around it. And then they kind of filled that in with what specific mark, marks were on their, on their rock. And so they drew a picture of their rock and some of them had, we had color with them. We're adding color in on those. And they could turn the rock over and show the other side, if it was a flat rock or different angles. And what they were trying to do is to get enough of a diagram using words and pictures um, or numbers about that rock so that um, in they had 15 minutes to record all their information about the rock. And at the end of that, we took all the journals and we put them in a little ring with the rocks in the middle. And we sat down around the outside edges of it. And one by one, kids would take turns <coughs> taking a rock from the center and saying, I think that this rock, you couldn't put the rock on your own journal. I think this rock goes with this journal and they would put it on the journal where they thought it matched. Then the next one, and here's why I see it. I see that, you know, this one here, they're saying it's got these green spots and the stripe. Look, there's the green spots, there's the stripe. This one goes with this journal. And then the next kid would go like, okay, this rock, I think this one's going to go over here. So when it's when your turn, you could take a rock from the center and put it on a journal. Or you could take a rock from one journal and say, I think this one actually goes over here. Or you can say, I think that this one doesn't go in this journal, but I don't know where it goes. And so I'm just going to put it back in the middle. And so we went around and everybody put a rock on a journal. And then we went around another time. Does anybody want to make any changes? Does this feel right to you? And everybody matched up their rocks with their journals. And it was really, really fun. And then we kind of looked at these rocks and we were thinking about time and how long that rock, what, what, what did the world look like when this rock formed from a different state? And then how long has it taken to kind of get worn down to this state? How long do you think before this rock then becomes a grain of sand? And we were speculating on that. And then we... Um, I, I had them write down a bunch of those thoughts, these observations, questions, and it reminds me of. So we did, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. We wrote those down. And then they looked through those resources and pulled out a few of those lines to create a poem. 
and everybody wrote a poem about these rocks and then few of them felt comfortable sharing them and they were awesome. So there I chose out of all the stuff out there, one phenomenon. And if you think like, well, that sounds like a good activity. It'd be nice to have some more activities. This is a book. Like it even changes the color of my screen. Like when this book comes on, the world that is a rather cool all of a sudden becomes warm. Look at that, right? So this book uh, called How to Teach Nature Journaling is about how to teach nature journaling. And you can buy the book. It is also a free download from my website for any educator anywhere in the world. You can get this book, which will turn things warm. Um, the, actually, I don't know if the download has the same effect, but you'll find out. Um, the, um, and we're, um, there was a website, which we made along with this, called How to Teach Nature Journaling. And that website is disappearing, and we're going to be putting all of these, all the activities. So this comes with, ooh, 31 activities, just like the one I explained. That one with the rocks, it's in the book right? And um, as well as sort of, you know, chapters and sections on like, you know, how, how do you, um, um, yeah, if you go to the store there, you can download it right from the store. Um, and the, uh, so what we did is we started with some play in nature. We were skipping stones by the river. And then we, um, then we kind of came away from the stream and we sat under a tree and had some kind of focused time with doing kind of intense observation of these things. We then played another game where they got to match these things and then broke into a discussion um, around the cross-cutting concept of stability and change. And then wrote poetry and um, that experience because of the, the part of your brain that is involved with attention is the same part of your brain that's involved with memory and they we we because of that deliberate intense attention that we paid, um, that experience by the river is now vivid for me as well as those students. Um, so um, I, I saw um, that uh, someone was, was, was pointing out, um, Jan was pointing out in the thing that I'm, I'm also kind of, um, you know, I, I was you know, making icons, I was circling things in my page, drawing arrows between them, right? So that, that is one of the strengths of getting things out of your electric meat and onto a little piece of paper. Because I can put a big question mark next to something. I can circle something. I can draw arrows between two different ideas. I can't do that here, but I can do that here, right? So, um, it's, it's a really, really powerful tool. Let's now jump back to the document cam and we'll see if this time, hey there, my hedgehog. Um, so here is, here's the way that I think about this. Um, what I've got, is, hold on a second, that is, that's not the droids I'm looking for, I'll use this one more here, all right, so here's, here's a way to think about it, 
draw yourself a little triangle. And on one corner of this triangle, um, I'm going to put a big exclamation point here. And I'm going to write, I notice. So this is my observations. And my ability to make observations and see things, it gets better and better and better and better and better with practice. I start there and then often go into those observations stimulate me to ask questions. I wonder. And another fun part of this is that the question, once I put it down, very often the first questions that you ask are not the most rich and interesting questions. So what we're getting is the question that is behind the question that's behind the question. You can get several questions that will tie into each other or one will daisy chain into the next. But you can't get that if you're not writing them down. And the it reminds me of the it reminds me of is this um, a lot of people will kind of initially kind of rock why obser observing is important um, and why asking questions is important. But this it reminds me of sort of feels like, you know, the unloved stepchild of I wonder and I notice. But I want to point out that this is actually a critical piece. And uh, we actually saw that happen in here when I was making it reminds me of it then reminded me of other animals have this lighter under fur and kind of got this whole duck down thing going that happened because of an it reminds me of the it reminds me of is going to do two things um, one is so if this if I notice is the activity of attention I wonder is curiosity. It reminds me of is two things. And one of them is creativity. And I t am hesitant even using this word, word because creativity gets so overused Create everybody, you know, anytime anybody is selling anything or wants to say something is good, they will say, they will say that this is creative, right? It's just a buzzword. So um, being a scientist, I like to define my terms. I, when I say creativity, I mean a very specific thing. By creativity, I mean your brain's ability to make useful connections between seemingly unrelated things. So useful connections between seemingly unrelated things. And what you're doing is you're training your brain to be a connector. And the more you practice connecting, the better and better and better you're going to get at it. But that is a skill in itself, to be able to look at this and get to there, right? But by practicing this, you get better and better at it. So useful connections between seemingly unrelated things. The other thing that it reminds me of, it reminds me of is actually this, this double whammy. It is creativity and it is connection. So if this reminds me of my daughter, if it reminds me of movie nights where we kind of all snuggle together on the couch and everybody gets their favorite stuffies and very often the hedgehog comes out and kind of lines up with the fruit bat and they'll, they'll watch it together. You know, that 
connection for me makes me even more attached to the little hedgehog. So, um, when students are looking at a phenomenon and they make an it reminds me of that connects something that they're looking at to something in their own lived experience their connection to that place and that phenomenon is deepened so if this reminds me of um, abuela's papusas hey that is wonderful. That is really, really powerful. And that is going to make that experience so much more meaningful to that kid. That's why I put I notice I wonder it reminds me of down on my page, and I will often use it as a checklist. Do I have observations check? Do I have questions check? Oh, I didn't do it reminds me of let's see what happens with my brain. If I add that in as well. That's one triad. And then there's one other triad. And this is again, when I am using words. Words are a very specific, um, a very, very um, specific way of describing phenomena. And it um, forces me to kind of get discrete observations and pick them out of all the stuff that I'm looking at in a way that's really different if I am drawing a picture. When I'm drawing a picture, I, I can be getting parts of an observation that are um, where I may not have have specified some detail, but just by default, it ends up in there in my picture because I have to draw this other corner here. It makes my brain look over there and see like, oh yeah, there's another little foot sticking out there, right? Um, so the way that you will observe when you're drawing pictures is really different. And you don't wanna get wrapped around the axle about having to make a pretty picture. So another way of thinking about this is diagrams. So anytime you don't, feel comfortable with drawing a picture, just call it a diagram. Start adding in all sorts of labels, and that works. You can also make um, maps. Showing things that's any form of visual communication. And if this doesn't look like a house, all I have to do is write house, draw a line to it. Now that's a house. So diagrams, maps, um, cross sections. All of those are visual tools, just the same way that making bullet points is going to make me think in a different way than writing in full sentences or even in paragraphs. Or adding little labels in. or making a title. Each one of these ways of playing with words is going to make me think in a different way. So I take this ball of tricks, this ball of tricks, and I'm gonna put them together with my numbers. And my numbers, you know, that could be a um, a, a stem leaf plot. Um, that could be just timing something and 
or saying that this happened at six o'clock or counting how many of something um, I see. Um, starting to add in more tricks of ways of including numbers. So this is kind of fun. Here's an, an even, like do, if you are tallying something, you can do it this way, but check this out. This is an even better way to make tallies. So there's just a little footnote. Instead of doing the one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, what I do is the first one is a dot, the second one is a dot, the third one is another dot, and the fourth one is another dot that make a little box. One, two, three, four. Then the next ones are line, lines, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So every group of ten is a box with an X through it. Twenty-three more show up. And then five more show up. One, two, three, four, five. So this dot line method is developed by foresters, people in the forestry department, as a really useful tally method. And you can just, you can add that to your nature journaling notes. It's a really cool thing. So what I've got is I've got words, pictures, and numbers. I've got a notice I wonder it reminds me of. These two sets of, of things come together and you put that down on the page. And that's where this kind of, of an experience comes from. And then what you have is, is people making observations, asking questions, um, making connections, and, um, and it's a very different experience than, oh, look, there's a tortoise over there. Everybody look hard at that. Because again, you stare at nature, and nature just stares back at you. If you really want to get your brain to engage with it, you need to get your electric meat to, I need to shake it up and do, um, and, and, and take it further. Jeff, this has been amazing. We have just five minutes left. So much great information. Does anybody have a quick question for Jack? before we wrap it up. Yeah, Joni. By the way, while Joni's unmuting, I have to tell you one of the best Hort teachers for high school students in the region. Go. When is the next class? <laughs> oh, um, so <clears throat> there's, so, there, there, here's some, some great ways to kind of, uh, to, if, if, if you enjoyed this, um, if you like my teaching style um, and want to do more, here's a bunch of, of resources. Um, I am going to share my screen. Um, and I, I'm glad you enjoyed this, Joni. Very much. Thank you. That was a lot of fun. Do you like the hedgehog? I love the hedgehog. I love the way you teach. Um, absolutely. All of it. All right. So here's the deal. Um, so this is my website. It's johnmuirlaws.com. There's um, over here in for teachers is the teacher resource overviews, videos and ideas for teachers, stuff about the Wild Wonder Conference, free nature journaling curriculum. So that's that book that I uh, showed you. The Nature Journal Connection, I've got free cross-cutting concept poster sets that people can put up on their walls. Um, and then stuff for doing, have, geeking out on, on uh, so, so there's, there's a lot of resources here, but there's a few things I just want to uh, highlight. Number one, um, I'm going to actually start by going over here for events with John Muir Laws. And here we go. Look at that. And what this is, is uh, this is my calendar. And you see, these are, what are these NJEF? That's the Nature Journal Educators Forum. Every week, there's an online discussion by Nature Journal educators all around the globe who check in and we geek out with each other about these things. And if you can't make it live, we record them. Um, and um, also, what's up on Thursdays? Well, 
on Thursdays, um, every Thursday, I teach um, a, um, a, 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 a free, sometimes I have a special guest on, like here I've got Jordan Silva, who's a colored pencil illustrator. Um, and I'm going to bring uh, her on, and she's going to talk to everybody about her colored pencil technique. Um, it's free. Right, so you just click on this, click here to join meeting, and you're in. And if you can donate to me, that's great. If not, that's great. Um, also, all of those, um, if we go to uh, recent lessons or tutorial archives, these are places where you can see recordings of all of those past classes. Right? So you see some of these are Nature Journal Educator forums. These are just recent ones. But then I've got them categorized. Like these are all ones about drawing birds. Those are all about drawing birds, drawing mammals, drawing reptiles. And so there's, there's tons of free, there's no paywall here. And um, so when we get to, um, if I, I just kind of, I'm going to click on, on one of these. So this is a video workshop. And I am, that, that I did with the Audubon Society. And, you know, here. Um, and so we imagine cans. We, um, so the, um, and uh, because you can do it. Um, so then let's go back into for teachers. Um, so videos and ideas for teachers, if you click on that, um, it brings you to part of the archive that has all of the Nature Journal Education forums. That's all stuff that is for teachers. All of those videos there. But wait, there's more. Um, the, uh, the, for the low, low price of absolutely free, um, this is the nature journal connection, um, video series. And these are a higher production value set of videos that I made 40 videos. So a classroom teacher could do one a week with their class and it assigns a little project and give some skills. And by the end of the, 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 the year, your kids would all have a ton of nature journaling skills. And, and it gives them like, a, like this week, here's what we're gonna do. So um, I'll just kind of bounce over to one of these. Here's this making this map one. And um, a little musical intro. And I'm gonna skip on. Um, so, um, so the, uh, So, 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 I, so I'm kind of describing maps, then I'm kind of, you know, kind of doing this in, in theory, talking about, um, you know, how to create a key and sort of fundamental parts of that. And the end, I give them a little project. Ooh, cross-cutting concept. Bam! Oh, oh! Right, so, um, so that is uh, one episode from, you know, the Nature Journal Connection. Excellent. And, 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 and if I can't, Jack, I'll make a plug of, there's so much information on this website, but he's, Jack is also connected to this worldwide network. So when you join the conference, you'll see all these other ways of doing it. I'll go back to the boxy critters. You don't worry about the shape. You worry about, you make a box and then you fill in the colors or the, the features on that thing. So there's lots of ways to learn this. So, but he's also a professional. So if you 
watch his videos, please donate to his time because uh, today's session was sponsored and funded by the US Fish and Wildlife Service um, for the Lower Columbia Nature Project. So I, I thank them. I think Juliet and Misha are on the call today. So thank you so much to the Fish and Wildlife Service for, for sponsoring. Greatly appreciate that folks. Yeah. Um, but but also, if you don't uh, um, have funds to be able to support me, you are doing good, magnificent, beautiful things in the education that you're doing. And just find um, a way of passing it forward. Um, I want to point out we have every year a teacher education conference. We're actually starting a teacher certification program like the Master Naturalist program. Um, um, and uh, this is for our 2021 teachers conference, but we will have, um, we will have, actually we didn't do a teacher conference last year, but we're going to have one this year and we're starting a teacher sort of uh, a, uh, a nature journal educator certification program. Um, and the, uh, so later this year, um, you can find out about that. If you want to find out more about my stuff, you can where is this? Uh, there it is. Um, subscribe to my, not, no, no, not that. No, there it is. Get the monthly newsletter. If you get my monthly newsletter, I will uh, keep you posted on all these sorts of events. You'll find out like what new videos have come out, what new resources. Um, but so let's see, we've got, um, let me just kind of go to this teacher resources overview to make sure I didn't, we've, you, you've got the curriculum. You've got this live forum. Um, We've got this uh, conference uh, in 2022. Uh, right, so this, uh, we, we will we'll soon be announcing our next Nature Journal Educator Conference. Um, the, uh, and so we've got two, yeah, two conferences. One is the Wild Wonder Conference, and then we've got one specific for teachers. Um, the Nature Journal Connection, I showed you that these cross-cutting concept posters. There are these, uh, it's a free download from my site. You can get these sets of posters and there are several versions of it. Some are made to be colored in by the kids. And with these uh, and others already have kind of grayscale um, shading on them if you don't want to bother with that. Um, and then uh, what I suggest people do is just sort of have those up in your classroom and then challenge your kids. Like, can you make a better um, scale and proportion one. And if like, if you can make a better poster, then I'll replace this poster that's on the wall of my classroom with the one that you did, right? So eventually you can have sets of posters and once a few of them go down, other kids are gonna want to get their poster up on the wall, right? So then you've got them thinking in a meta way about those cross-cutting concepts. Um, and so you can get that free download. Um, if you go to my, so this is just an item that is in my store. You can see some of, you know, some of these, here are some of the, the posters. Um, but uh, um, also available, so you can get that download, the free download of the book here. If you look on my store, there is, there's lots of things that are at no cost. So some of the books and things, there is a cost of those. Oh, The Laws Guys to Nature Drawing and Journaling. Joanne, how do you like that book? I love this book. And so does um, one of my partners at Heritage also has the book. And I did donate and sign up. And I just, I'm not going to be able to get enough of this. I absolutely <laughs> love it. This is perfect. Thank That's you. Well, and let fantastic. me put one more one more plug out there. When when Jack and I first started chatting a few months ago about this, um, I don't know if you've ever been to the Vancouver area of Southwest Washington, but maybe we can figure out a way to get Jack up here to visit us from Northern California in the fall, maybe for uh, a hands-on workshop and and figure out uh, how we can get that funded. But there's that opportunity to 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 bring you to town at a time that works for everybody and. That would be really fun. I would love to come up there and join, it, especially if I could, uh, if we'd find a way to swing it that I could also bring the Adventure Girls. Uh, little thing one and thing two, we love kind of getting into all sorts of business, all sorts of places. Um, oh, I see that Valerie's got um, uh, uh, a hand up. Um, uh, Valerie. 
There we go. Hi. Um, I just wanted to mention, Jack, that on your website, there's there's also a way to find local groups. Yes. So that whether you're pursuing your nature journaling as an individual or as a teacher or whatever, that's a, a fabulous support system and also to, to build your own skills and, you know, really go that way. So it's not specific to teachers, but it works. That's yeah. that's great. Um, yeah. So what, what Valerie's talking about is there's there's two things. One is to find a nature journaling mentor near you. And um, that used to be hosted on my white website. We've now just migrated it over to the Wild Wonder website. Um, so you might be able to find somebody who is a nature journaling teacher in your area who you can meet with live. Um, also, a bunch of these people do online courses. Um, in addition to the classes that I teach, there are now um, I'm, I'm trying to, through this nonprofit organization that I started, the Wild Wonder Foundation, I'm trying to help people who are nature journaling educators connect with audiences all over the country and the world. So if you, for instance, are a nature journal educator, you got to get on that page because then your audiences can find you. Or if you're looking for somebody who's a local mentor, um, you'll be able to find one there. In addition to that, there are nature journal clubs that are local clubs where people go out and they nature journal together. You'll find also on the, the website a place to, um, to connect with your local club. And if there's not a local club in your area, information about how to start your own bam right um so that so it's it's a very um grassroots movement um there is no there's nobody kind of from the top saying like if you want to start a nature journal club you need to pay us a commission or anything like that and so it's it's all kind of independent people who are who are just into doing this it is so much more fun to do this together because if because curiosity is sort of the, the this primal connector that everybody has you get a bunch of people getting out in the field together curiousing together you go curious with other people it gets really 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 fun yeah. um, and i did put in the chat that misha uh the ranger for stargerwald uh, national wildlife refuge will be hosting a nature journaling this friday at 9 a.m at the Ridgefield uh, complex if you haven't seen their new administration building it's the north unit so when you get to ridgefield hang a right and go up to the new administration building. Misha Wood, um, I put her email in the chat. There's also a Columbia Gorge um, nature journaling Facebook group. Um, but it sounds like from this crowd and many others that we're gonna have something really strong here in Southwest Washington in no time. And I, I'm gonna guess that Misha and uh, her contacts up in Ridgefield are really gonna make that happen so thank you Misha. that is fantastic and and misha if, if we're, you're not already on our 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 list of find the nature journal club near you um shoot me uh, uh and, and uh, we, we uh, let me know and we can get you put on that map awesome and um, julia just put the address for the complex in the chat box so if you have time friday but it won't be the last one hedge you've been a joy to be with this afternoon I'm going to share my screen really quick to wrap us up. Um, oh my gosh, so much great information. If I can find my, uh, what's next here. Um, so once again, the nature, uh, Lower Columbia Nature Network, we meet monthly with our partners. So the Lower uh, Columbia Estuary Partnership, the Water Resources Center, the Fish Hatchery, like all of us who work to get people out. We have monthly meetings uh, in April. We're going to meet virtually. Um, and Juliet Fernandez, the Richfield manager, is going to help us learn more about our indigenous partners in our region uh, so that in May we'll meet at Camp Hope, which is just south of uh, Louisville Park in Battleground. If you haven't been in Camp Hope, amazing, gorgeous site with some beautiful forest, we'll meet out at Camp Hope and hopefully meet some of our indigenous partners for an on-site meeting in May. On June, we're going to be down at Fort Vancouver meeting with the uh, Forest Service, uh, Gail Miller and the National Park Service, because we do have a national park in our downtown. We're going to meet down at the fort and go for a walk over to the land bridge with our new partners, the Super Nature Adventures. Um, so we have lots coming up. And then in July, we're just all going to go adventure on our own time and then meet back in August and September for more. So um, if you need more information, please visit our website, the Lower Columbia Nature Network. You can subscribe on there to join our mailing list. It's open to everybody. If you want to 
just be on the mailing, but not the meetings, just let us know. Um, our, our email is really easy. It's hello at lower Columbia nature network.org. And Michelle will get you on that list. If you want to join our members page, the password is really easy nature for you. Super easy. But Jack, this has been beyond my wildest expectations. Thank you so oh. much for your energy and your time and, um, and special else? guest, special guest hedge. Thank you. And Juliet, uh, do you want to unmute and, and add anything to the conversation since you brought this to us? Thank you. Well, I think all credit goes to Laura Columbia Nature Network, and I'm just so excited about all of the work that you and Michelle are doing, Jane, to bring all of these folks together. It was so much fun learning all of this. I benefited from, from it, too, and I'm energized. I'm, I'm so excited to see the comments that you guys have in there, and thank you so much. John, for your time and oh, this, this was this was fun for me. I had a great time, and and Hedge also first time that Hedge got to come into one of these workshops. So very excited there. Very entertaining, and you have such a, a fun teaching style. Was smiling through the whole thing. That's great. Thank you all for all that you do. We appreciate you and your ripple effect in the community. It's awesome. Yeah. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, we will put the video on the YouTube channel for the Lower Columbia Nature Network. So if you missed something, if you wanna rewatch it, if you wanna share it with a colleague, but like I said, in the fall, hopefully we might be able to pull some more magic together and, uh, and, and, and welcome uh, Jack to the Southwest Washington region. If you have not been here, Vancouver is amazing. And the refuge system that Juliet helps manage is a jewel of the Columbia River. I, I, I'm, you, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, 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 I would be thrilled to get to come out and geek out with all of you folks. Um, you got to bring Hedge though. Oh, oh yeah. Hedge, 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 Hedge will, uh, actually, usually my daughter's, uh, stuffed harbor seal is the one that, uh, she sends on adventures, but, um, this, this, this one would, 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 would come. So we, we, you have to remind me to bring Hedge. This, this has been great. Hey, folks, thank you so much for coming. And also, I just want to say um, that the, the work that you're doing as, as educators, I think this is the most critical calling of our day. Um, we need you. We really, the world, our community, um, if anything is going to kind of help us pull out of our tailspin, it's educators and teachers. Mm -hmm. um, and I am so grateful for the the commitment that you have to working under really really difficult conditions you're still here even after you went through covid that was hard on everybody but for teachers and you're still here um i just want to say how much i love and respect you for doing the work that you do Thank you. And if there's any way that I can be of support to you, feel free to reach out to me anytime. I'm easy to find. You go to that website and go to contact. You can find my phone number, my address, email. It's all there. If there's any way I can be of support to you, please let me know. And um, thank you for what you're doing. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. And thank you again, Jack. This has been such a joy. Thank you. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Joni, keep up the good work out there. Working on it. <laughs> this is fabulous. Thank you for organizing all of us and for the opportunity. It's just wonderful. You got to tell me when you do a, a project out at Heritage, I'll come watch. Yeah, there's more meetings. Another meeting tomorrow. We don't know what's happening.